While Russia continues its attacks on Ukraine, what role is China playing? And could the distraction enable China to move against Taiwan? Joining me to discuss is president of the Population Research Institute, author of The Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. Steve, uh, I want to begin with the Russian incursion into Ukraine. There are conflicting reports on the Ukrainian civilian death toll, but estimates say it could be near 2,000. Russia has acknowledged that nearly 500 of her troops have been killed in the fighting so far. Ukraine's estimated Russian troop losses at 9,000. Meanwhile, most of Ukraine's major cities are under assault. I want to ask you, what do you make of the timing of this Russian invasion? In a recent report in The Guardian, which uh, China's denying, incidentally, uh, China's said to have asked Russia not to invade Ukraine during its Winter Olympics. Is China directing Russia's invasion in some way? Well, they're certainly coordinating their plans. I mean, Putin flew to Beijing just as the Winter Olympics uh, was beginning, and he signed 15 agreements. That's one five agreements <laughs> with, uh, with Russia, uh, including oil and natural gas, because he wanted to have another buyer for his oil and natural gas if, uh, if the Europeans decided, and, and, and the Biden administration decided not to buy uh, Russian oil anymore. He also, just as Putin's panzers rolled across the uh, plains into Ukraine, uh, they also agreed to, to buy Russian wheat, again, another market for Russian commodities that may not be uh, uh, very desirable on the open world market if they're sanctioned. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of coordination. And you mentioned uh, the only demand that, uh, that Putin's Chinese partners had was, please don't start your spectacle in Ukraine until we've completed our own Winter Olympics spectacle. Mm -hmm. And so he did. He waited until after the Winter Olympics was over uh, before invading Ukraine. So there's been a lot of coordination. There's a lot of uh, secret support. And in fact, not so secret support. If you go on Chinese social media, Chinese social media yeah. is just ablaze with praise of Putin as a strong man, with criticism of Ukraine and the United States and the world for not supporting Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. Of course, they don't call it, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, doesn't call it an invasion. Uh, and he calls for negotiations. But uh, I think what he really means is a unilateral, unilateral surrender by Ukraine to Russian forces, which I don't think is going to happen. No. And, uh, you, you know, people don't realize Putin and Xi in China, they've met three dozen times one on one. This is not a, a uh, you know, uh, a fly by night like Biden going into the edge of the NATO meetings. Th th this is a close alliance that I believe the United States has helped push even closer. Uh, Steve, I'll get back to all of that in a moment. I want to talk about NATO expansion and the possibility of Ukraine joining the alliance. Was that the chief reason that Putin decided to invade now? What's the end game here? Well, it's very curious. You know, apparently, uh, we gave uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, the impression that if he wanted to join NATO, it was up to him. And, of course, that's a red line for Putin, uh, because Putin has said that, you know, he will never allow Ukraine to join NATO. Now, that's not Putin's call. He is a bloodthirsty killer, as we all know. He's a war mm -hmm. criminal who ought to be tried. And, uh, you know, the same way that the, uh, the the Nazi officials were tried at the Nuremberg tribunals after after World War II. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, there, 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 are, there are wheels within wheels going on here. And make no mistake that 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 Xi Jinping hopes to see the United States, which is China's chief rival in the Indo-Pacific, bogged down in a proxy war in Ukraine. Uh, so, right. so there's a lot. Everybody is is you know advancing their own interest here. Um, I want to I want to get into the reportage and what we're seeing in the American media. Some are calling this Ukrainian resistance their 1776 moment. I, I've even seen others calling President Zelensky of Ukraine a new Churchill. But when I look at the map of this Russian advance, and we'll put it up for you, it's clear that Putin has the country surrounded, and he intends to cut off Ukrainian troops and supply lines. And you see his forces in the north and south meeting up, which is his intention. Is the media building up a simplistic false hope 
given the reality on the ground and the support and the might that Putin has and is advancing here? Yeah, um, you know, we will have to see how this all plays out. But can I just say here that, uh, that, that this should never have happened had we continued uh, the previous administration's policy of supplying arms to Ukraine mm. and, and not buying uh, Russian oil, uh, not uh, allowing the Europeans, as insofar as we could, not to de become dependent on natural gas from Russia. Uh, this would never have happened. We fattened Putin's coffers to the tune of $650 billion. And now, belatedly, we may take some of that away from him. Belatedly, we are sending arms to Ukrainians to defend themselves, and we should. But I don't mm -hmm. want uh, to see any American boots on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, imposing a no-fly zone, as some reckless people are suggesting, right. would put American combat pilots directly into conflict with Russian pilots. It would result in Russians' death. Uh, it would be an act of war. So I think we need and to American pause deaths. Here. Yes, we need to pause here. We need to think about what's going to happen long term. And I'm I'm quite happy to send humanitarian aid and and defensive arms to the Ukrainians as long as they're willing to fight. And, you know, the thing is, uh, seeing the Ukrainians defend their cities must also give Xi Jinping pause because he's sitting waiting on the other side of the Taiwan Straits to see how things turn out in Ukraine. And if the citizens of yeah. Taiwan fight like the Ukrainians uh, and three quarters say they would take up arms to defend their country against a Chinese invasion, uh, then the takeover of the island might cost tens or even hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, not that that matters very much to communist dictators. It doesn't matter no. to Putin. You mentioned casualties. Uh, I, I don't know if 9,000 Russian soldiers have died, but I do know that one particular Russian battalion, uh, 550 men, only 18 came back. So I know there have been serious losses, five, six, seven yeah. thousand losses of Russian troops so far. I know there has Steve. been shelling. Yeah. You, you raised an important point that I don't want to lose sight of. How did Biden lifting the sanctions on the Nord 2 pipeline uh, and the shutting down of oil production in the United States facilitate this invasion of Ukraine? Well, it absolutely facilitated the invasion of Ukraine because uh, he was saying basically to the Germans who want access to rush to natural gas that you can continue uh, to support Vladimir Putin. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, funds his army pays his troops, builds his weapons using money that he gets from selling commodities like wheat and natural gas and oil to the rest of the world. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we're supporting uh, Germany in NATO. On the other hand, Germany has become dependent upon Russia for natural gas. Now, here's what we've seen in Germany, Raymond. This is very interesting. Uh, the German chancellor, the new chancellor, the replacement for Angela Merkel, who's finally gone off into that good night, is to, is to say this is a turning point, a Wendepunkt in German, a turning point because we will now start up our nuclear reactors again. Uh, we will stop the Nord Stream pipeline. We will look for other support sources of oil and natural gas. So they have basically made a 180. Uh, Viktor Orban this morning also made a 180, said that uh, we're going to start supplying uh, humanitarian aid and, uh, and defensive weapons to uh, the Ukrainians. And, and it's interesting because some of the Russian oligarchs as well are starting to turn on Putin. And this is his base of support. Yeah, there is resistance in the country, in Russia. But, uh, you know, Steve, uh, as I listen to you talk about the sanctions that Biden lifted on the, on the Nord II and uh, cutting off American production of oil here at home, making us more dependent on Russia, whom we still, up to this moment, are purchasing energy from. We have to remember, back in 2014, it was Biden and Obama who allowed Putin to invade Ukraine, and the world did nothing. Nothing. That was really the invasion of Ukraine. This is the continuation of that invasion. And now, eight, to eight years later, everybody's wearing pins and their little Ukraine flags. I think it's too little too late. But, uh, Steve, an estimated two million refugees, many of them children, you've seen those heartbreaking yep. scenes out of Ukraine. They fled the country yep. in this first week of invasion, prompting talk of a humanitarian catastrophe. There is a discussion of an international criminal court 
investigation of Russia for war crimes. Is that warranted now? Well, it is, but, but it won't take place uh, until this conflict is resolved one way or the other. And, and you're right about back in, in 2014, uh, the new Peter the Great, uh, and, and uh, make no mistake that Vladimir Putin imagines himself as the person who is going to reassert uh, and reestablish the Russian Empire bit by bloody bit. Back in 2014, he took part of Moldova, he took the Crimea, uh, he took parts of eastern Ukraine. So this uh, death by inches in Ukraine has been occurring for many years, and most of it up until now, well, all of it has occurred under uh, an administration that Biden was involved in. Uh, so, uh, again, this was an entirely preventable conflict. But think about this. On the one hand, uh, we're still buying Russian oil because we shut down our own oil production after being uh, energy independent for several years under the Trump administration. So we're giving money to Russia for its oil at the same time that we're providing aid to Ukrainian uh, forces to fight a Russian invasion. Uh, isn't that a little bit contradictory? Uh, shouldn't we be cutting totally. off uh, the oil that we're buying from Russia? Shouldn't we be restarting uh, the Keystone Pipeline? Shouldn't we be allowing drilling on federal lands to increase energy production? Uh, we can do that. Uh, we can become, again, the largest energy producer in the world. And, and we must if we want to end, you know, end this conflict. Well, you know, Steve, I read a in very interesting piece today, and it was about how Russia has been funding a lot of the climate activism in Europe and in the United States so that to, to put pressure on public officials to outlaw fracking, to reduce uh, gas and, and uh, oil exploration so that he could have the market to himself. He's rather brilliant in that sense, uh, never mind that he's a horrible, murderous dictator. But starting last weekend, with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Washington and a lot of the media magpies have been describing Putin as delusional, crazy. Now, as I said a moment ago, there's no doubt he's a killer, he's a thug, he's as far away from Christianity, no matter what he says, as he could be. But mm -hmm. has he slipped into madness, or is this just the dictator executing his playbook? Well, I think it's clear that for the last 20 years, he's dreamed of reestablishing uh, the Russian Empire. He's dreamed that he's a reincarnation, not that I believe in reincarnation, of Peter the Great. Mm. Uh, and he has <laughs> set about doing that. Remember uh, the invasion of Georgia. Uh, remember the, the, uh, the, the brutal put-down of the Chechnyan uh, revolution. Uh, he has been moving, encroaching for years and years, moving in the same direction. So this should really be no surprise. The surprise to me is really how poorly the Russian army has performed, uh, how yeah. Russia was not able, despite an overwhelming superiority in terms of uh, numbers of Air Force planes, has been unable to take control of the skies. I think they have serious, serious problems with the maintenance of their equipment. Uh, they're using 80s and 90s technology. And the tanks are breaking down, the armored personnel carriers are breaking down, and the troops are young conscripts. And I feel badly for everybody in this conflict, uh, yeah. the young 19- and 20-year-old conscripts from, uh, from Russia who were told they were going to a training exercise and are now dying in Ukraine, uh, not really knowing how they got there or what they were supposed to be doing there. And, of course, the Ukrainians uh, who are dying every day because of Russian shelling Terrible. and bombardment. Uh, it's it's yeah. uh, war, yeah. war is uh, hell, as we say. Yeah, well, uh, Zelensky, the, the pro Ukrainian president, said the, these are like Russian children that were sent in, you know, to do—they're yeah. they're not warriors, they're children. Uh, Steve, yeah. I, I was struck by the hero's welcome Putin received at the Beijing Olympic Games, and it made me laugh that Nike and some of these film companies have now cut off product to Russia this week while tripping over themselves to sell to this horrible Chinese regime that routinely destroys human rights, human life, religious rights. It's disgusting. But following the games, Xi said his friendship with Putin and Russia had no limits. What's the play here? Uh, the play here is for China. Uh, China, uh, there's an ancient Chinese stratagem called sitting on the mountaintop and watching the tigers fight. I'm sure that Xi mm. Jinping encouraged Vladimir Putin to go into Ukraine so that he could embroil uh, the United States in a proxy war in Europe and give him a free hand over time so that he could dominate the Asian Pacific. 
Uh, that's mm -hmm. what she is thinking here. Uh, and we say it in a, in, you know, the Chinese have, have very elegant sayings, sitting on the mountaintop watching the tigers fight. As we say uh, more bluntly, let's you and him fight. And it's in, in Xi's view, you and him are now starting to fight. And he's hoping that this will give him a free hand vis-a-vis uh, -vis the South China Sea, vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, and uh, right. allow him to right. take aggressive actions in that theater. While we're distracted, and, and Washington, make no mistake, everybody in Washington is now focused on Ukraine. They're all wearing their right. Ukrainian flag pins. Everyone seems to have forgotten about the country that unleashed a virus on the world two years ago and killed five or six million people. That's the long-term mm -hmm. threat. That's mm -hmm. the more serious threat than Russia uh, over time. And we can't take our eye off the ball. Well, and we're all fixated on this invasion of uh, Ukraine eight years after the fact, while the southern border of the United States, millions of people are streaming in. And look, it's not the families from Central America that you necessarily have to worry about. But we know, and I know from being down there, they've identified Middle Eastern folks, folks from the Far East, uh, coming across that border. And their intentions are not pure. And they're not just coming to do jobs Americans don't want. And we've taken our eye off of watching our own borders while we worry about Ukraine's. It does, it, it is a little mind boggling. Uh, Russia reclaiming this land, though, Steve, and I want to get back to this. You touched on it. Russia's justification is Putin's uh, notion expressed is we are reclaiming land that is our own. This sounds remarkably like. China's attitude toward Taiwan. Is this a test run for the eventual Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Does it set an international precedent? Yeah, a a absolutely. Now, the only thing that I think really upset Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party about Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine was that before he did it, he recognized the two breakaway provinces in eastern Ukraine as separate nations. And, and the Chinese Communist Party leader said, wait a minute, you can't do that. You have to respect the territorial integrity of the sovereignty of nations, meaning that China claims Taiwan and the world should respect the fact that uh, Taiwan uh, regards Taiwan, Taiwan is a breakaway province of China and that uh, China mm -hmm. should be free to take it back at any point in time. Uh, of course, Taiwan has never been under the control of the People's Republic of China. Taiwan has been separated from China since 1895. The People's Republic of China was established in 1949. And so Taiwan has never been a part of the People's Republic of China. And my position with regard to Taiwan is the same as my position with regard to Ukraine. The Taiwanese people, three quarters of them, 77 percent in the last poll, said they would take up arms to defend their country against an amphibious invasion from mainland China. I say uh, that we arm them with defensive arms, with anti-ship missiles, and create a kind of porcupine out of the island so that anybody who tries to encroach on it walks away with a, a handful of quills um, mm -hmm. and loses their invading fleet uh, in the depths of the Taiwan Straits. Uh, the Taiwanese are perfectly willing and capable to defend their own freedom and uh, defend their own democracy if they're given the tools to do it. And we need to help that happen as soon yeah. as possible. Not wait, not wait until an invasion is already underway and then belatedly say, uh, we're going to send you aid. Uh, by then, yeah. uh, it will be too late. Or we're going to slap sanctions on China while American business continues to do, you know, to trade and, and partner with them. Um, I want to talk about Taiwan and its vulnerability. Just this week, there was a massive power outage reported as uh, a result of an accident at a power plant. Could have been a hack, leaving five million households dark. Taiwan is home to one of the world's largest chip makers for semiconductors, Steve. How big a blow would it be to the West would China launch an invasion of Taiwan, or should it? Well, you, you make a very important point, because we have a greater strategic interest in Taiwan uh, because of that chip manufacturing uh, technology, mm -hmm. uh, because of that, uh, because of the other things that Taiwan makes uh, in, its, in, its, uh, in its industries that we rely upon. And if you don't have chips, you cannot make any electronic device, cars, phones, everything. Uh, production lines will stop without those chips. And 94 percent of the world's chips are made in Taiwan factories. The other 6 percent are made wow. in South Korea. 
So, so we're yeah, well, terribly Joe, dependent on, on yeah. The, the pre President Biden in his State of the Union said, fear not, Intel's opening a, a big uh, semiconductor uh, uh, chip manufacturer in Columbus, Ohio. How long will that take, Steve? Uh, that'll take about three years to get up and running. And so in the meantime, uh, if the chips stop, stop coming from Taiwan, then we won't be able to make any uh, electronic devices. And make no mistake, there are lots of chips embedded in our um, fighting machines these days, in tanks and planes and, and other things. Uh, so, so without chips, uh, you know, modern, modern uh, war fighting capabilities grind to a halt. Now, China wow. would very much like to get their hand on that facility because they themselves, uh, despite pouring billions of dollars into uh, Huawei and, and other uh, high-tech enterprises in China, which are called nat national champions, uh, they really have not been able to produce uh, the kind of modern chips that power, say, iPhones and MacBooks and computers. So they'd mm -hmm. like to get their hands on that chip manufacturing capability in Taiwan. They would also like to have access to the open ocean, which Taiwan <laughs> gives them. You see, right now, they're sort of trapped in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, because you've got Korea, Japan on the north, the Taiwan, the Philippines, kind of bracketing. The first island chain brackets uh, China's access to the open ocean. If they got Taiwan, they would have access to deep water ports. Mm -hmm. And the next thing between China and, and uh, the west coast of the United States would be Hawaii. So it would be Taiwan mm -hmm. is a key strategic place for the United States in a way that Ukraine, as much as I have sympathy for the Ukrainian people, Ukraine is not. Ukraine doesn't provide any any vital uh, resource for us. Uh, they don't sit in the way of uh, uh, in the in the middle of a uh, vital access to the open ocean. Yeah. Well, Congress and the president better get on the stick about Taiwan. I agree with you. And and to imagine that these major electronic companies have not figured out to produce the, uh, the essential semiconductor chips here in the United States is mind-boggling, Steve. I mean, it would be like McDonald's, you know, having all the cows in Europe or something. It, it, none of it makes sense. Steve, b before I let you go, why do Russia and China still enjoy most favored nation trade status, which they do as of this moment? And why is the U.S. still buying gas and oil from Russia? Well, we should we should cut off uh, the supply of gas and oil from Russia immediately. But if we did, if we did, gas at the pump would go up to eight or nine dollars a gallon, uh, because right now, because we've compromised our own energy supply, uh, we have to buy energy. We have to import oil from from other mm. countries. Now, look, if you're worried about global warming, and 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 and, I, and I'm not. I'm not worried about a one degree rise in global temperature over the next century, quite frankly. I'm worried about uh, the price of gas at the pump for ordinary Americans uh, over the course of the next weeks and months. And we've allowed ourselves to become dependent upon Russian oil at the same time we're trying to stop Russian aggression in the Ukraine. Uh, the whole th this thing makes no sense. If, if Biden thinks clearly about this matter, he's going to restart the Keystone Pipeline. He's going to allow the drilling of uh, new wells on American soil and allow us to become energy independent again. Stephen Mosier, we will leave Stephen it there. Thank you for being here. Bully of Asia by Stephen Mosier is available at bookstores everywhere and online. And you can follow Steve on Twitter at Stephen W. Mosier. Thank you so much. Thank you.